Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. The case that I'm going to be looking into today is one that is still unsolved very many years later. It is known as the Keddy Cabin Murders. It happened in 1981 in a resort town in Sierra Nevada and there were quite a few victims to this sad tale. The, again, one of the worst things is that it's still not been solved after all these years later. It's really, really frustrating, but let's get into the case and maybe one day it will be solved. Who knows? I'd just like to say, if you do have any suggestions, please do let me know. I, I'm sorry about not being able to do them as of yet, but I will obviously get around to them when I can. So, you know, just keep them coming. And again, my apologies, but I will do my best to try and cover some, hopefully within the next couple of weeks. So one of the victims was a mother and she was called Glenna Susan Sharp and she went by Sue. So that's how I'm going to refer to her throughout this entire video because that's how she was commonly known. She was born on the 29th of March in 1945. Then you have one of her sons who is called John Sharp. He was born on the 16th of November in 1965. Sue's daughter, Tina Sharp, although you don't initially find out what happened to her straight away. But again, we will get into this and you will find out exactly what happened. She was born on the 22nd of July in 1968. And then we have our final victim who wasn't actually a part of the Sharp family, but was John's friend called Dana Wingate, who was born on the 8th of February in 1964. Sue so is described as a very shy woman, but and very, very quiet. And just before obviously all of this horrific incident happened, she had not long since moved her five children down here away from Connecticut where her husband lived and their relationship had recently ended. He was called James Sharp and he was by all accounts abusive. She was very unhappy in their relationship and she wanted to leave for quite a while from my understanding, but she finally did take the plunge and she took the kids and she moved away to start a new life. So she decided on Sierra Nevada, apparently because of her family lived around that area and so she wanted to be closer to them and that is why she chose to go around the area. In the beginning, money was very tight and so they did actually live in a trailer, but when she finally earned enough money, she moved herself and the children and she started renting this cabin in a, the Caddy Cabin Resort. It was cabin 28, it's a very famous cabin because of what happened there. And it was just more space for her and her kids to spread out a little bit. So living in this house, you have Sue, John, who was 15, Rick, who was age 10, Greg, who was age five. Then you've got her daughters, which was Sheila, who was age 14 at the time, and Tina, who was age just 12. As you can imagine, it's like a cabin in the woods kind of thing. You know, it's very secluded. There are other cabins, don't get me wrong, you know, and you, you do have the neighbors and I'll put pictures up so you can see like how close they were. But the woods surrounded them. It was, it was very like secluded in that sense. And it was beautiful, you know, they absolutely loved it. So you wanted a fresh start for her and the kids and this was it. So we're on the 11th of April in 1981. Sue, accompanied by Sheila, goes to go and pick up John and his friend Dana. And they head back I believe it was a five mile journey back to, to their cabin to Keddy, the Keddy Bazaar. Around two hours later, John and Dana decide that they're gonna go back to Quincy, which was where they actually were picked up from, because they wanted to go and chill out with some friends and they had plans just to go back there and do that. And so the boys decided that they were gonna hitchhike to go and do that. So a witness actually came forward to say that she picked up the boys in front of a tire store. She drove them down the road, which was where they got out and that was their friend's house. This witness was named Donna Williams. There was also witnesses that state that these two were seen at this party at Oakland campsite in Quincy. So, you know, maybe that's what their plan was. Maybe they were going to, you know, go to this party. Sheila, which is one of Sue's daughters, the eldest of the daughters, she decided that she was gonna go and hang out with one of her friends, which was the Seabolt family. So they lived in a nearby cabin. They lived pretty much facing, so they were directly neighbors. You could literally see the cabin from each of us houses kind of thing. And so she left at about 8 p.m. She left her mother with her two youngest brothers, Rick and Greg, and they had their friend over who was called Justin Smart. She watched some telly, she chilled out for a bit, and then by about 9.30, she did go back home. 
But then she decided that she was actually going to spend the night at the sea boats. And so, you know, shortly after that, that is where she went. She went over there and she stayed the night. So now we are on the next morning, which is the 12th of April. It was around 7am and Sheila was heading back home. And that was when she came across the horrific scene. She walked into, essentially, it was just awful. There was blood splattered on the walls. There were three dead bodies inside of that cabin. There was John, which was obviously her brother, his friend, Dana was also there and there was a body under like a cover. She couldn't tell who it was, but it later would turn out that it was actually Sue, so her mother. They'd been bound and tied with rope and Sheila, obviously devastated, ran back to the Seabolt straight away to tell them what she had found. This is when James Seabolt went over to the cabin 28. He apparently went in through the back door. He said he was going in to check to see whether anyone was alive. He realized that no, but none of them were alive and so he went back outside and that is when he found Greg, Rick and Justin sleeping in the bedroom. They had not been touched, they were still alive and they were just asleep. So he quickly gets them out of the window to get them out of there, probably not wanting to drag them through the living room, that horrific scene. Obviously, you're not going to want to do that. So he pulls them out of the window and gets them to safety. Many people did think it odd that these children were still asleep. And I mean, so did I, but I don't, I don't know. Either they saw something or they were just really heavy sleepers and literally slept through everything, which it is possible, you know? These are, obviously the police were called straight away, they attended the scene and from the very beginning it was said that the scene was not handled very well at all. So for starters, you've got James who had gone inside the crime scene and he'd walked all about, uh, yes, okay, he was trying to see if anyone was still alive, but that is still him contaminating evidence. Whichever way you look at it, he's still in there and he could be disrupting the crime scene. Well, he did disrupt the crime scene. And so you have that straight away and then the police arrived. They did not cordon it all down and everything. People walked through it a few times before they finally did stop everyone walking through it. And so it was a bit of a mess. And it was said that the the police did kind of a shoddy job of that, at least. When they got there, they found a hammer and two knives. One of the knives was actually a steak knife and it had been bent in half. Literally, that just sh goes to show how brutal this attack was that one of the knives was bent in half due to the sheer force that was put behind it, which is just horrific. The other knife was a, was a butcher's knife and the, again, the attack was just so vicious and so violent. And again, that's another reason why people think it really odd that the boys were still asleep, you know? How do they not hear anything if the, these attacks were so violent? Police did examine the crime scene and did deduce that due to the blood splatter, which was you know, on the walls, on the ceiling, it was just everywhere, that they had actually been, in fact, killed in the living room, all three of them. Sue was lying on a side under the cover. She was pretty much naked. She had been gagged with a blue bandana and she had this imprint on her head, which would later match to a gun. She had had her throat slashed and had blunt force, I can't say it, blunt force trauma to her head. Dana had been killed through manual strangulation and she also had blunt force trauma to her head as well along with john they all had blunt force trauma to the head john's throat had also been slashed and i believe that the weapon of choice for the blunt force trauma was her hammer which is just horrific police began processing the scene they found an unidentified fingerprint on a handrail which i think to this day is still not identified they also found that all the lights had been turned off all the curtains had been closed, the phone had been pulled off the hook. Whoever did this didn't want anyone to, you know, see them accidentally notice anything or be able to call them. They just wanted to get it over and done with. At first, it wasn't even really noticed that Tina was missing. Until People did tell the police, but they just didn't seem to care. Like, I don't know why, but they didn't. So they didn't take Tina being missing very seriously initially. And that is just really frustrating. Police found Tina's jacket in this was missing as well. And the shoebox, and inside the shoebox, it was said that there was these various tools in there and both of those were missing. 
police, of course, interviewed people and they interviewed the, the Seabolt family who said that they didn't hear anything. A couple that did live nearby did say that they were woken up at about half one in the morning by the sound of muffled screaming, but when they went to investigate, they could not find where it was coming from and by that point it had already stopped and so i guess i don't know they didn't think much of it they didn't know where it was coming from and so they just went back to sleep i mean you'd never really assume that somebody was getting murdered like down you know a few doors down from you or something would you you just think what was that strange noise okay it's gone now go back to sleep so marilyn smart was justin smart's mother and if you remember justin was one of the boys that was staying over that was unharmed he got out with the other two youngest kids so his mother Marilyn stated that she actually found this bloody jacket in her basement and she believed that it was Tina's. She stated that she did give that jacket over to the police but apparently the police have said that there is no record of that ever happening or any record of the jacket. Also Martin Smart who was Justin's father claimed that he had this claw hammer gone missing from his household. It was a bit suspicious that you know, this had all done with a hammer. They found one hammer on the scene. It wasn't the hammer that Martin, of Martin's, but, you know, he's he's claiming that this hammer was stolen, I guess. I don't know. And it was as if he kept... He knew a lot of things, clues and evidence and things like that, and he, he kept trying to throw them to the police, and people thought that it was like he was trying to pull suspicion from himself, in a sense. So, going back to Justin Smart, he gave a few different accounts of, of that night. On one occasion at two police, he said that he dreamt the entire murder. Another time, he said that he had actually witnessed the murders. And later, under hypnosis, he said that he actually heard these strange sounds coming from the living room, whilst he and the, the two younger boys were in the bedroom watching television. And as a result of hearing these sounds, he goes over to the living room, he takes a peek in, and he sees Sue with two other men. One of them had short hair and this moustache, and the other had long hair with no facial hair whatsoever. He also said that both men were wearing glasses. He said that this is when Tina and John then came in and they began arguing with these men, and that is when this fight broke out. After the fight happened, he saw Tina being taken out of the cabin by one of these men using the back door. Which, obviously, I've already told you the description of these men. They did make a composite sketch, a sketch of that, and I will put that up for you guys. They described these men in their late 20s or early 30s. One was between 5 foot 11 and, and 6 foot with dark blonde hair. And the other was between 5 foot 6 and 5 foot 10 with black greased hair. At this point, they finally started taking Tina being missing seriously. They had the FBI out looking for her. They had everything they could. They were just searching the woods, searching everywhere, and they couldn't find her. It actually took years for Tina to be found. On the 22nd of April in 1984, a call came in to Butter County. So that was a completely separate county to where Tina had even gone missing to where this had all even happened and so this call comes in from an anonymous person and as a result of that they actually find Tina's body. This caller stated that the body was there but the record of this call wasn't actually found until 2013 when this deputy who was actually assigned to the case was looking through this evidence log, this box of evidence and he came across the tape in the bottom. It had just been kind of left there and sealed and not been touched and just put in a box somewhere and shoved on a cupboard kind of thing. It it was just insane. The caller's identity to this day still remains unknown, but that caller knew something about this. You know, it's highly believed that maybe they could have even done it. Maybe they could have been the perpetrator. And because Tina's body had yet to be found, they just wanted to get, I don't know, maybe their name out in the papers again or something. I don't know, the notoriety, notoriety up. And so they decided that they were going to ring in and get Tina's, you know, body being found back in the news again, which would get whoever did this back in the news again. It really was as if with this case that the police department, anything that was of relevance or suspects that needed looking into that they just didn't do it, like that tape for instance, nobody even knew about it until years later. And that should have been one of the main focal points. Not the main focal point, but they could have looked into that more and try and, I don't know what they could have done, but they, they just shoved it in a box and as if it didn't exist. That was what they did. So with regards to suspects, Martin Smart was one of their lead suspects throughout this case. 
as I said before, he was the one that was giving the, the police clues and things like that, and it was as if he was trying to throw them off his scent. Police later found out that Martin, I believe he was known as Marty, was actually abusive towards his wife, and people did report that Sue Sharp, who was brutally murdered, was the one trying to counsel his wife and trying to help her in this horrible relationship that she was in to help her try and get out. She had been in a horrible relationship, abusive, things like that, and she did get out. And so she was just trying to give her advice and just help her out on how to do it, I guess. According to reports, when Marty found that out, he went mental. He was really angry that Sue had gotten involved in his personal business. And, you know, it could be his motive if he was the killer, that could be his motive behind this attack. Pretty quickly after the murders, Marty actually left the area for a while. And to go along with that, his son was in that cabin and he survived. So I find it really weird why they spared the children because they're in the bedroom sleeping. There were three of them. People are vicious. I mean, Tina was only 12 and they took her life and so why why spare these kids was it because he didn't want to take his own son's life that is a speculation that is what some people do believe again that is not fact that is opinion maybe not even my opinion but somebody's opinion it's it's what some some a lot of people do think so looking into this, police do believe that there was a minimum of at least two people who committed this crime and, you know, it would be pretty difficult to do that with one person. You've got Sue, who's an adult, you know, John and then Tina and then Dana, they were all there and to, to manage to brutally murder all of them people, there must have been more than one, surely. But as a result of that, obviously Marty was already suspect, they began looking into his roommate who was called John Boudy. John Boudy was an ex-con and police pretty quickly started to believe that he may have been his accomplice. As time went on and not much was found out, people really did begin to believe that the police were involved in a cover-up. They hadn't make an made any arrests even though there was quite a lot of things against the suspects, well not a load, but I'll get into that a bit further on, but they didn't make any arrests, even though there were leads coming in. There was no kind of progression throughout the case whatsoever, they just didn't get any further. All these people had been murdered and they just didn't get any further with it and people did begin to suspect that something was going on. In 2001, Dana's dad did state that he believes that the police really did mess up on this case. He said that the police seemed to be making everything worse, that he hadn't ruled out the thought of a cover-up actually occurring, just like many other people had not So, get this, the sheriff at the time was named Doug and he was very close friends with Marty. Hmm. And it is thought that that is possibly why this was like a cover-up. Of course, Doug did state that he was not friends with Marty and that all he did was counsel Marty and his wife on their marriage. But why would you go to a sheriff as a marriage counsellor? That doesn't make any sense to me. You go to a counsellor, you go to even your friends, people you know, so that could be why, because they maybe were friends, but you, you wouldn't go to the police, just as a generalised thing, to counsel you on your marriage, you just wouldn't. Nothing actually happened until with this case until 2013, when a new sheriff, Greg Wood, and he reopened the case. This is when they started to reinvestigate it with investigator Mike Gambord, and they actually found some pretty interesting things with regards to the police cover-up theory. They are still working on this case today, so he starts looking over the case files and things like that, and he comes across this letter that Marty had wrote to his wife, Marilyn, and this letter actually stated, I've paid the price of your love, and now I've bought it with four people's lives. You tell me you're through? Great. What else do you want? So they literally found that letter, they had that letter, and they just did nothing with it. Okay, it might not be in re relation to, obviously, the four murders, but it's a bit weird to word it that way, if that's not your intention. If you get me, I would never write something like that. I've taken four people's lives. Why would you write that if you hadn't? It's very weird. It wasn't really known that this existed until they came across it. So again, something that's just been shoved in a box. Maybe a massive vital piece of evidence has just again been shoved in a box and put away on the evidence shelf. Marilyn state stated that she did recognise that it was her husband's writing, but that she never received that letter. So obviously it was never sent. 
But I guess, truthfully, they couldn't prove anything from that. I mean, you can. It's just a letter. He's not confessing to the murders, but he's just implying something along those lines. That was when they also found out that anonymous caller, that tape of the 911 call who called in about the body, about Tina's body, it was obviously just stored away in a box too. What they did then was they spoke to Martin's therapist. This was one he had in Reno when he moved away for the little while, straight after the murders, I might add. And his therapist claimed that Marty actually confessed to the murders to him. After he received this confession, he did go and report that to the police. But once more, nothing was done about it. He literally, he's wrote it down on a note, kind of. He is there. There's everything is pointing to him. He literally confessed to his therapist. I don't know why you would do that if you didn't do it. The therapist took that to the police and nothing was done about it again. They didn't look into it. They just did nothing. Then in 2014, Karen 28 was actually tore down because people interested in it were going up. They wanted to see the murder cabin. They were squatting in it, things like that. People were there all the time and they just didn't want that anymore and so they did tear it all down. But obviously all the evidence and all of everything is still in the police lockup. In March of 2016, a man who was actually metal detecting near a sort of pond actually came across this hammer. It was the hammer that Marty told police had been stolen, had gone missing from his house. Well, it's believed to be that hammer anyway. It matched perfectly to how he was describing it. And it was believed that this hammer was probably used in the murders and then was tossed in the pond, you know, to, to get rid of the evidence. Although I don't really understand that because they didn't try and get rid of any other evidence. Like, if you're gonna throw away that hammer, why not throw away the others? Unless, I don't know, they had fingerprints or blood on it or something and they just wanted to get rid of that. Now, this hammer, when it was recovered, was that badly decayed because of the water and, you know, all of the everything on it. They didn't get anything off it, unfortunately. Just as recently as 2018, Gamba actually stated that DNA from a piece of tape from the actual crime scene matched a living suspect. Now, I say living because Marty and his accomplice, John Booty, have since passed away. So, I don't know, if it was Marty, maybe we will never know because they, he's gone and he will never tell us that he did it. But this link to obviously a living suspect, I believe they have like six living suspects at the minute in this case, we're really hoping that obviously something comes from that and that they can finally find out who did this. Whether it be Marty and Boudet or these new suspects that they'll find out. I did read literally as, as soon as just a couple of months ago that the department, the police department, really do believe that they are very close to solving this case. So that is what I'm really hoping for. You know, we're really hoping for a win on this one. A win. I don't mean a win. I mean to finally get justice for these poor four people that were brutally murdered. It was horrific what happened to them and they deserve justice. This person or people who did this to them have been free for too long and they need to be caught. They need to go to prison and serve the time that they should have done. They should have been caught a long time ago. Unfortunately, that's not always the case, but that's what you hope for. So I really do hope that this person or these people will finally get caught and the Keddie Kevin murders can finally be solved. So yeah, look out for that in the news. I will be keeping myself updated on it. I found this case very interesting. And you know, I will update you guys if and when this case is solved. Let's hope it's a win. But yeah, that is the end of the case. If you've enjoyed this video, give me a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you are new here. Again, thank you so much for my regulars. I appreciate you. Anyway guys, that's all I have today on the case of the Keddie Cabin murders. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, bye.